Ok, um, good morning, bon dia, buenos dias. Um, well, um, today I'm going to show you not basically something that I want to teach you anything, but something that I have experienced. Um, I think these are the talks that I like the most, those that are not trying to teach anything, but just showing experience. First, uh, this is the agenda of the talk, so well, I will present who, who I am. And one important point is what you can expect from this talk in order to not have high expectancies. Um, why I decided to do this migration? Because uh, as probably all of you, we have other things to do at home. Um, so, and then I will, well, simply show which are the steps of the migration. The important part comes at the end, that it is the performance comparative between, obviously, Spring and Quarkus. And finally, I will give you some references that helped me just to do this migration. And, yeah, that I, I think you can, you can use them too. Well, basically, I'm that guy being painted. Um, well, I'm Java champion, also uh, co-leader at the Barcelona Java User Group, co-founder of the conference JBC and Conf that we host every year uh, in Barcelona. Currently, I'm software engineer at Tetrate, a company, small company in the US, uh, doing things about service mesh, Istio. But I've been part of Red Hat, Ocado, and Netcentric. You can find me on Twitter using my Twitter account, my email, my blog, and also you can check my uh, repositories at GitHub. Oh, by the way, during the, all the presentation, you can find here the link to the slides, so you can use them uh, whenever you want. Um, so what can you expect from this uh, presentation? So, well, this is my opinion, only my opinion. Probably you can find issues or ways to do things better in this presentation. Uh, it's not a magistral lecture, so I'm not trying to teach you how to do things. This is not the Mando way, so this is not the way. So this is only one way, and I expect that you use it as a point of uh, starting point for doing your own uh, migration, if you want to do a migration. This is something that works, okay? But it's not, the intention of the migration was not to do the perfect code, just only to do uh, a migration from Spring Boot to Quarkus fast, and that works. These are the versions that I was using, 2.4.2 on Spring Boot, and the Quarkus is, uh, well, it's not the last one. The last one came, came out two days ago, that it is 2.9.0, but I used 2.8.3. By the way, you already know who I am, but uh, I want to know, well, uh, have a pulse of you. So who here is using a Spring, Spring Boot in production? Okay, and who is using Quarkus in production? <laughs> okay, <laughs> and who is interested really in doing a migration from Spring Boot to Quarkus? Wow, that's very interesting. And the final and more important one, who is going to watch Eurovision tomorrow? <laughs> Perfect, I will do. Okay. So, first, for those of you that do not know what it is Quarkus, who, is, who doesn't know who, what is Quarkus? Okay, fine. So, for those of you that do not know what is Quarkus, I will do a brief presentation. In this presentation, I have some screenshots, because I'm a bit old, and uh, these are the games that I was playing when I was a kid. So, well, if you can uh, try to think which are the names of those games, well, we can have a, I don't know, something at the end. Okay, so what is Quarkus? Basically, Quarkus is a Kubernetes native Java stack, Java or JVM stack that you can use, well, Java, Scala, or Kotlin, that it is, well, I would say that the main purpose is that it can be compiled using GraalVM, so creating a native artifact. It can also run on hotspots, on, on on Java virtual machine, but you can almost 
always move your code into GraalVM and create a native artifact. And one of the things, well, there are several options like Quarkus. So Quarkus is not the only one. There are Micronaut, Helidon, and others, also Spring Native. Um, the best, well, the, the most important thing that I like from Quarkus is that it's not reinventing the wheel. So if you have used REST, Hibernate, Vertex, and others, you don't need to learn new tricks. So just simply use Quarkus. Quarkus is behind. You code using your own, your libraries that you have used uh, in the past, and Quarkus do, will do its magic, right? This is the funny thing, or the good thing. You don't need to really learn Quarkus to do applications using Quarkus. Well, that's not entirely true. You need to learn something about Quarkus, right? The important, well, the, the key facts about Quarkus, don't, don't use those numbers as something uh, like uh, a contract. Those are figures to have in mind what we are talking about. It's way faster. Even not going to uh, native, Quarkus will produce uh, an artifact that is faster than the traditional stack. 10x, so it's smaller, so it produces a um, uh, low memory footprint, so it will not consume uh, as memory uh, as other uh, traditional stacks. And it's basically also focused on easy to code. As I said, you don't need to learn new things. It just use the things that you have been using plus some new bits, but not something that involves a high learning curve. Open source, that's awesome. Uh, and this is amazing. They have um, a lot of people behind Quarkus and producing releases every now and then. So I was updating these slides last week. I added the, the last version, so I compiled the code, everything, 2.8.3. This morning I was checking, and oh man, uh, the new version came two days ago. So it's, it's hard to follow the, the, the pace of these releases, but this is amazing because they are introducing new features and fixing bugs and probably introducing new bugs. This is how it works, right? Um, there are tons of extensions. So as I said, those libraries, you need to use like the library that it is adapted to Quarkus. So they are optimizing and reducing um, introspection so in order to be able to be compiled into native. And there are lots and lots of them. So I was counting more than 150, and you can use Kafka, Camel, Keycloak, Spring, uh, Rest Easy, Vertex, well, Jagger, Flyway, you name it. So there are tons of them. And even they have one important thing that it is they create something, but users can create their own extension. So you can go, you can go to Quark, Quarky Bears repository, and you will find companies and people that are creating more and more extensions. So that's uh, great. About the Quarkus evolution, well, it started more or less end of 2018. And, well, this is not updated. Uh, the last version is 2.9.0, and they are producing versions, wow, every week. This is a famous chart about performance regarding Quarkus. Um, oh, man, sorry. Okay, so um, the important thing here is not the numbers, but the relationship. So from the traditional stack that it is almost 140 megabytes in memory, for the same, more or less the same application, if we use Quarkus, we are reducing by half the memory, but if we go to native, we will see how complicated it is to go to native. We are coming from 140 to more or less 12. So we are reducing a lot the memory consumption. And the starting time, or the first response time, well, it's dramatic. So coming from four seconds, more than four seconds. If we go to Quarkus, it's around one second. But if we go to native, 16 milliseconds. And 
the hard part here is that on the complexity to move from here to here, more or less, is adding dash p native in the command line. That's it, more or less. <laughs> so it's not complicated to move from, uh, from uh, the JVM one to the native one, right? Even if you don't have Graal installed in the, on your machine, Quarkus will download the latest uh, version of Graal uh, container in, and it will execute and produce the, the native artifact. Regarding the, uh, the project, well, there are only taking uh, one week, you can see there are several pull requests, uh, closed issues, new issues, as I said, when you introduce new features, probably you are introducing uh, uh, errors. And there is the Quarkiverse repository where you will find also extra uh, libraries. And the contributors, well, it's growing and growing. Now there are more than 600 contributors to the project, so it's a, a very live project. So let's talk about the migration then. Uh, for me, it's, Im it's important this image because I never moved from stage one in this game. So I was very happy to put stage two here. Um, so why I decided to migrate? Well, my experience with the Spring Boot is that, well, it's easy to develop and do things because they abstract all the complexity. Probably sometimes abstracting complexity creates more complexity, but uh, yeah, it's easy. But for me, it was, well, it takes a lot to start an application. Uh, tests are, mm, well, uh, taking lots of, um, lots of time. Probably we didn't do tests correctly, but the context is started every time on most of the tests, so it takes a lot of time. It's super heavyweight, so it consumes a lot of memory. And one of the things that I don't like is that there are too many things happening under the hood. So I, don't really, I start an application with Spring Boot, and if you check the log, there are several things happening, libraries starting that you didn't expect. So I didn't like that way. So I heard about Quarkus, and I said, okay, they, it, is, it seems like the promised land, but let's check how green it is, this grass. So it says that it is easy to develop applications, it's fast, it's lightweight, um, and also it's Graal VM compatible, so it produces uh, native artifacts that uh, will take less memory and will go, will go faster. What is the important thing about this native artifact? Well, you can increase the uh, cluster density. So where you had 10 applications, now you can have 100. So that means you can accept more requests, probably. Um, and also, it can mean that you can consider going to um, function as a service. So you can go to Knative and produce something that will be only paying on a public provider only during the time that it is doing something. The time that it is not that is waiting, it will not uh, consume money. So this is very interesting, especially on the Kubernetes world. So okay, I decided to check it. So these are the libraries about this Spring Boot project. Um, this is uh, it, this this project is the Spring Pet Clinic REST, and it and I took this one because I thought, well, these are the most common libraries. So every project has Spring Data, Web, Security, well, uh, Swagger, CDI, well, whatever. So I took this project and I said, OK, let's move to the Quarkus one. So here you can see there are several library libraries. And except this one, the other ones don't have Quarkus on, on the net. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Probably I should disable. So, uh, these are the libraries in the, uh, in the Quarkus world. These are the well, Hibernate, JAXRS, OpenAPI, SmallRy, MicroProfile, CDI are common libraries. So let's talk about migration steps. Regarding CDI, it's, well, very easy. Just simply you add, well, no, in this case you don't add any, any dependency, and just simply move from AutoWire to inject if you are not uh, if you are still using AutoWire. Um, 
Beans declaration are using application, in this case, application scope, and it has auto injection on constructors, and it's lazy by default, so it's very convenient. Um, when I was doing this migration, well, it was very easy. I didn't miss any feature. Um, even now, we can simply decide which beans can be uh, injected, so the implementation of the bean, and we can have uh, the criteria with uh, several conditions. Uh, the only thing is that whenever you inject something, uh, it cannot be private, so at least it has to be packaged. JPA repositories, well, we moved to Panach repository. Um, and in this case, I was using Panach repository base because by default, it was that the identity type was, is long, but in this case, was in integer, so I was going to base just to define which is the identity type. And we have the usual uh, methods just to uh, handle those repositories. But we don't have derived methods, query methods. So those find by age and name, whatever, we don't have that. That's the, the only drawback. Regarding REST, well, we need to move to JAX-RS, and it's more or less a case of replacing strings. So in this case, annotations, um, one by one, except if you are using request mapping in Spring that you can pass uh, the verb, uh, the path uh, in the same annotation, then you need to break it down. But it's very easy. Um, nothing to mention here. Regarding Spring security, well, um, in Quarkus, we have these roles allowed. Well, we specify the uh, roles that are uh, allowed to enter or to call the method. Uh, and in Spring, we have this pre-authorized with an expression language. Well, we can just say this, 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 and this. So these are the, the more uh, changes. And in this case, the security was implemented or was stored in a database. So um, we need to use uh, Elitron JDBC and then configuring uh, on the properties file, we will well, configure where the security is stored. As I said, uh, it doesn't have an expression language. The, regarding cross-origin, well, it's a matter of adding these two uh, properties in the properties file, and everything works very, fine, very, very easy. But at least. I didn't find a way. In Spring, I think you can configure cores per controller. In Quarkus, I didn't find a way. Uh, and it is uh, at global level in the <coughs> properties. Probably there's a way, but I didn't find it. Um, regarding metrics, it's easy. So just simply add a, metrics, a small right metrics extension, and that's it. You will have uh, uh, metrics. Um, but the thing is that, by default, there are, no, uh, there are different. So uh, Spring is using micrometer notation, and Quarkus is not using that. It's using profile notation. But you can, you, you can add this property, and then it will create the, the same notation. Um, you can use microprofile in order to add custom metrics if you want to the methods. In this case, in this project, the metrics was, was used just to get um, database consumption metrics, OK? And uh, in Spring, it, this, is, this project was using uh, aspect-oriented, that it is very easy to get information with expressions using wildcards. And we don't have AOP in Quarkus. So one way is to annotate every method that we want to get metrics, as I, as I mentioned before, with the microprofile annotations. Um, or um, uh, we will see now how we can do it. Um, in my case, I was using um, the, micro, uh, the microprofile metrics extension with the property to be compatible with Macrometer, but I could be just simply using Micrometer extension, and then uh, everything works fine, because it also detects the same annotations. 
Regarding the validation, with the Spring, uh, in this case, Spring validation, we need to move to Hibernate validation. It's more or less the same. As you can see, the code, we are moving from a controller advice to uh, um, implementing an exception mapper, and well, more or less is the same. So yeah, it was easy. So parity of features. Swagger, simply add extension open API, and you will have everything. And if you want to specify more information, either you use uh, the annotation open uh, API definition in uh, an, an application that extends application, uh, or you use the uh, properties file, and then you annotate there all the properties. Uh, it has Swagger UI out of the box on test, but you can specify also that you want it on, in production. But at least I didn't find a way in, in Quarkus to specify which REST paths I want to include in the Swagger, Swagger documentation. So in Spring, you can say, OK, scan this path. So I could hide some endpoints, but I didn't find a way to do it uh, in Quarkus. As I said, AOP was used for metrics. Uh, so we don't have AOP in Quarkus. But to get exactly this, or more or less the same, it's just simply a matter of adding this line in the properties file, just simply enabling the Hibernate metrics. And that's it. You will even have more metrics uh, than the other project. So we, uh, I didn't miss uh, AOP. With local caching, again, it's more or less the same. It's a matter of string replace of the catch result annotation. And that's it. In, in the properties file, we can even configure how those catches are behaving. Very, very easy. Here it's uh, more tricky. We start with tests. With tests, um, I didn't find any other way than rewriting everything. Just because in, with Spring, you are using mock MVC, for instance. But uh, with Quarkus, you need to, re to use rest assured. Well. It's not that it's super different, but it is a bit. I prefer the rest assured way, but it's, uh, it's your choice. But I needed to rewrite everything. Then with the Spring, there's one thing that you can simulate roles just to test security. But with uh, Quarkus, I didn't find a way to do it. So I needed to create a test injecting a user that belongs to a, to a to a role just to check that. With resources, it's super easy to test uh, test resources. I mean, you know, on your test, you are you going to use in-memory databases, for instance. So it's very, very easy. Just using Quarkus test resource, and then there are several test resources that you can use, and it will start uh, an in-memory database. I prefer to use test containers to do these tests. Uh, it's very powerful. There have been a few talks about test containers in this conference. Uh, I totally recommend that you take, take a look uh, about it. If you go to my, to my blog, you will find there a post about testing uh, an eight layers application with test containers. That's very, very interesting. And with mocking, using that extension, Quarku Jayuni Mokito, and then you can mock beans, and that's, that's it. It's a very easy. So we reach a point where I say, forget everything that I told you. Uh, this is really bullshit. Nothing, it's not important. So that's not the way. The way is to use the Spring extensions. Quarkus has several Spring extensions that will make your life even easier, not me. Uh, because you don't need to touch your code. Just simply add the extension, and your application will still think it's doing Spring, but it's not. Um, 
because uh, those extensions are using the same interfaces as Spring, and Quarkus will create the good code, really, in the end, using those interfaces. So you have all those extensions. For instance, dependency injection. Just simply use the same annotations. Do not change anything. These are all the supported annotations, and every day there are more and more uh, supported features. With, uh, exactly, with the Spring Dependent Injection, you have all the, uh, all the extensions that I mentioned. Spring Data, you have all the extensions here, so all the uh, interfaces. And even we can have those derived query methods that find by name, blah, blah, blah. Even we can have that. So yeah, don't change your code. Spring Security, the same. So your code, your code is still thinks it is working with a Spring. So we have reached a point where, OK, you could, you could ask, OK, OK, this is, this is a lot. I understand, well, you, need to, to, you needed to tell that. But what is the gain here? Is it worth it, or is it totally a waste of time? Well, let's, let's talk about the build time. A Spring Boot, JVM, takes four seconds to produce an artifact, more or less, uh, Uber jar, 48 megabytes. With Quarkus, wow, it's not worth it at all, 13 seconds and more or less the same size. Let's go to native. Three minutes. So build time is totally a waste. And it produces an artifact that is double the size. And if you use Spring extensions, more or less, or even more time. Well, you don't have to take those numbers as something super uh, exhaustive. It's something that, yeah, simply measuring how it works in my machine, that's it. So the conditions are the same for all, uh, all the processes. Uh, so build time, no gain at all. But I would say, who is really interested on build time? In my case, build time is being produced on CI, probably, and it is deployed. I don't care if it takes. 13 seconds or four seconds in my case. And if it's for local, Quarkus even has hot, uh, hot reload when you are testing. So if you change a file, it will reload your code. It will deploy the class that you have touched. And then you have your API running. And you don't need to create the artifact every time. Okay? Even it happens with uh, Kubernetes. Uh, but boot time. Boot time, the Spring Boot one, is 4.7 seconds. This, this application is very silly. There are five tables. It creates data into the, into the tables stored and boots an API. That's it. OK, 4.7 seconds, and it consumes 630 megabytes only just by starting. If we use Quarkus standard, it's 3.4 seconds. Well, memory, 250 megabytes. So we can or either reduce the machine that we are using in AWS, for instance, or we can increase the number of applications if we are using on-premise, probably, because we are saving memory uh, with each application. But if we go to, uh, to Quarkus native, we are moving to from 4.7 seconds to less than half a second. This is a dramatic gain here. And we are moving from more than 600 to only terabytes of memory, just by doing exactly the same. And the effort to produce and go from the JVM one to the native one is Nothing. No effort. The only effort is that I should activate the memory safe on Opera. OK. And with the Quarkus Spring Native, it's more or less 
the same numbers that uh, with the regular one. So the key thing here is, yes, it was totally worth it to move from more than four, around five seconds to less than half a second, and from more than 600 megabytes to around 20-ish megabytes of memory. So definitely, it's, uh, it's worth it to try it. And in this case, there is, there is effort, because the extensions are not covering 100%. But probably, there is no such amazing effort. Okay? I will give you some references, and one of them will help you on those migrations. So, okay, here you have the two repositories, the original one and the one that has all the changes. And if you want to know more about Quarkus, the main page, quarkus.io, the Twitter handle, and the developer, redhat.com, uh, you, you will find lots of uh, tutorials, very interesting and very, very nice to do. And Quarkus Dev is the, the mailing list where you can just simply ask for help. The interactive tutorials, in my opinion, are amazing. Just because they are using an interactive platform, Katacoda, where you have the tutorial on the left, and even you have an IDE, so you don't have to mess with your laptop at all. And you will have even an OpenShift console just to see your uh, Kubernetes microservices running. So it's very easy, free, and you have from getting started from, uh, for Spring Devs, Kafka, Hibernate, Monitoring with Grafana and Prometheus, Reactive SQL, and Reactive Hibernate. Totally encourage you to check them. There's also the cheat sheet. So uh, my ex-colleague Alex is producing um, a document with all the changes for every version of Quarkus. So if you want to be uh, up to date, just check that document and you will see all the features that are, have been included, fixes, and everything. To start coding, code.quarkus.io, you will select which are the libraries that you want, and it will produce an artifact even with a test. So that's very easy to start with. And when I was at Red Hat, I was working uh, uh, in this team that was producing a tool, an open source and free tool, that helps in order to migrate from A to B. There are several migration paths, and one of them is going from Spring Boot to Quarkus. This application will statically analyze your code in your application using a Spring, and it will tell you which are the changes that you need to do. It will tell you even story points just to, for you to see which is the magnitude of the change, uh, even which are the mandatory, optional, and so on. Even for every file, you will see which is the thing that you need to, to check and change, and the library associated, or sorry, the documentation associated to that change. And if you use the plugin, even you can have that analysis in your IDE. In the end, it's not that I tell you about me this a small and silly experience migrating this super simple application. These are real life experiences of big companies migrating. I totally encourage you that you read this Vodafone Greece that replaced Spring Boot with Quarkus. And they, at the moment, they even uh, not do it in, in native. So, well, you can check from real experiences and, say, and see if it's really worth it. That's it. Um, uh, if you want to ask me anything, please uh, do it. I will try to help. And don't forget, if you want to check uh, these slides, these slides have something interesting for you, that all the questions that I have received about this topic, I add them into the end of the slides. So uh, here you will find questions answered and you, can, you have rights to comment to that uh, presentation, so even you can add uh, your questions, and I will try to answer them uh, whenever I can. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, and I hope it was interesting. <laughs> Uh, 
one question about the, the migration to, from a Spring Boot application, which is in production. What do you consider as being a risk to not have the tests working out of the box from the beginning? Because, so, yeah, so if you are on uh, Greenfield, you can do Quarkus, that's good. But if you are in production, if you don't have a big limitation on resources, do you advise to do the change? Because that will impact production. Without the quality testing, that can guarantee that it's running on the same level. Well, that's uh, that's important question. Thank you. The question is: Is it worth it and not having the proper tests, right? That can give you the security that the migration has been done uh, properly. When you have them already in the spring, exactly. Exactly, that's the thing. So you should rewrite the tests. I would answer your question with an, another question. Uh, that is, what's the gain of the migration? So I totally discourage any migration if, no, if there is no such a great gain on doing the migration. Just simply by having the same application in Quarkus is not worth it because you are entering in a path of uncertainties, of errors, of uh, a lot of work, just to have the same? No. So the motivation for a migration should be, okay, I know there are some things to do, rewrite tests, uh, see uh, problems that I will find in, 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 in the process, but because I expect to have a great gain at the end. Let's say I want to move to Kubernetes and the current uh, application cannot do it. I want to move to function as a service, but I cannot do it with the current application. So if there is a big gain, then you can consider suffering from rewriting the tests. Without tests, well, there are two things. I would say that those unit tests are very important, but I would say that a gr um, super important test that you just should have is an end-to-end -end from outside your application. So that could start giving you confidence while you are rewriting your unit tests. But answering your question, if you don't have the proper tests, migration is like uh, super risky. So you need to start migrating. Uh, uh, but as I, as I said, it's important to have unit tests, but if you have good end-to-end -end tests, testing from outside, probably is something that uh, can give you a bit of uh, uh, security on that. So who, who has been encouraged to do migration? Who has learned anything about this presentation? Okay, <laughs> I'm happy, thank you. <laughs>